How does the fiddle inspire Prairie Métis author Michelle Porter? Let's find out. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to All About Books. If you love books, then you've come to the right channel because not only do you get to meet our author, you get to find out what inspired her to write her book. And for the latest author interviews, please be sure to hit that subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. So today I am so pleased to have Michelle Porter with us today. She is a poet, a journalist, and a writer, and we'll be chatting about her first novel, Approaching Fire. Approaching Fire was published by Breakwater Books in Newfoundland, and it's Michelle's incredible quest to find her great-grandfather, Métis fiddler and performer, Leon Robert Boulay. Welcome to All About Books, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here with you today, Crystal. It's an absolute delight. Now, Michelle, you have an absolutely fascinating family history. You're connected to the Red River Métis. And for those of us who, who don't really know anything about this family line, can you explain to us what it is exactly? Yes, the, the Prairie Red River Métis oh, uh, are the... <laughs> are the uh, descendants of uh, the uh, the legally recognized indigenous Métis that began in um, Manitoba and moved out to Saskatchewan and actually moved uh, moved out a lot, you know, to Alberta and, and British Columbia as well, but started uh, back when the first um, voyageurs were coming to Canada, some of the first traders, and of course, the majority of them were French, but not all, um, and married in with the um, different First Nation groups. Um, and as as time went on, they began to become a people, a nation. So you know, other 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 researchers and writers uh, write about the formation of that nation and what that means for. Uh, uh, Métis today and the awakening of Métis rights and the awakening of Métis, Prairie Métis consciousness. Uh, but my book is very personal. So, uh, and that's me making that link to that, that, that connection directly to my great grandpa. Fantastic. So Michelle, what was the initial spark that kind of lit that fire that you were like, oh my gosh, I have to do this. I have to write a novel about my great grandfather. There were a couple things that came together, of course, but first of all, it's the questions I've been asking myself my whole life. I was finishing uh, my PhD, which was about stories of home. Um, not my personal home, but um, home here in Newfoundland, Labrador, where I've been living about 11 years now, and looking at people who move and come back and forth, and there, uh, both First Nations, Inuit, and non-Indigenous people I talked to. And there's this beautiful way of people making home through movement. Now, if there's anything that defines Métis people and their background, and my childhood in particular, it's moving around um, and making home through this movement. So it was sparked by uh, me reflecting upon my personal story as part of my PhD. Um, but but at the same time, I was taking my daughter to fiddle lessons. And um, I had never learned the fiddle, but my whole life in the background were all these beautiful stories about the family band, the Red River Echoes. And my um, great grandfather, uh, who often went by Bob Goulet, uh, Robert Leon Goulet, but often went by Bob Goulet, um, and how uh, he was this pivotal fiddler uh, in, in Manitoba in the 1930s. And then he picked up and he and his daughters, my grandmother, uh, who was also part of that family band, moved off to BC. And you know, life, life changed there for them in, in Manitoba. So I was very interested in the story of this music during the 30s. What did this mean in Manitoba? What did it mean to them? And what did it mean to me as I was learning the fiddle alongside my daughter at that point. <laughs> and in Newfoundland and Labrador, where the fiddle means something totally different. And, and um, so it was, you know, 
a couple of things that came together, but the stories my mother and my aunties told me about this music. And finding um, online and some old sources of um, these old songs. And I was really interested, Michelle, in the way that you structured your novel. I thought that was such a fantastic way to, to bring a book together. You've got this beautiful collage of your poems. You've got letters to your grandfather, um, newspaper article pictures, ticket stubs, like such a great, um, a great breadth of, of of uh, materials. So why did you decide to structure your novel this way? Um, I, part of it is my, my poetry background. Um, yes. There's I, uh, the beauty in bringing together these little poetic moments mm -hmm. that allow the reader to make the meaning from them. There is that. But there's also my fascination with, as I started to look in the newspaper art, uh, archives, to follow the trail of my great grandfather and his music in um, newspaper advertisements, radio show advertisements. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's no way of telling that in a straight story mm -hmm. it, that, that remains true because there's so much I don't know. So I loved placing um, uh, little bits together that show the whole story, but also that, that some of it's incomplete. There's so much silences there that speak louder and that my story today is still going on. You know, the whole journey of, of, of looking for my great grandfather in the past is a part of me looking for what kind of relationship do I have with him? What kind of relationship do I have with Métis Nation? And how, how has that changed um, now? So, it started with following those beautiful newspaper articles that made me so excited because looking at those, those advertisements for uh, live music shows, for dance, uh, music for dances and, and radio shows um, was, you know, became this, this physical manifestation of all the stories that, that I had heard. Growing up, when you hear these types of stories, you don't know that they're important. I, 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 when you're younger, it's a wonderful story, but you don't know how important they are to other people. So my great-grandfather, Bob Goulet, um, appears in some of the research of, of uh, ethnomusicologists looking at the history of music in Manitoba, but they didn't know if he was real or not because they didn't know what happened to him. So... My search coincided with some ethnomusicologists who were doing research on Métis music and saying, who, who is this Bob Goulet? Is he real? Is he, you know, somebody else? Um, maybe it's just a figure that, that they made up. And I connected with a researcher and said, you know, I'm doing, you know, just said, I want to know more about this person. And I got this email back that, was, that said, what? He was real? You can confirm this? What happened to him? He disappeared. He was very important in the music scene at the time. Uh, but Nobody knew what happened to him. And I knew what happened to him, but I didn't know about the music scene portion. Um, so, so that was a beautiful part for me. Um, and it, you know, it, it's, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit going on in this book, of course. So there's that part. And then there was that part that's kind of the, the personal reckoning with sort of intergenerational, um, uh, trauma and intergenerational um, um, issues. And there's no better way to do that than through music and through understanding those stories of music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, certainly as a reader, I, I really enjoyed um, the way you positioned everything. And I can't. That's that's so beautiful to hear for me because it was, you know, I, it, it's an unusual structure in moving yes. from you know, the letters to uh, my great grandfather, to some of the, the, per the, the poetry that deals with in conversation with, a, you know, uh, memoirs of, a, of, of an old ancestor um, and, and, you know, the, the uh, poetry about the stories um, and, the, and the description of, of finding it. So there's so many things. And I did worry, how is the reader going to follow this? So I'm so close to it. I, I sent it out to a few people and, you know, I got beautiful feedback. So mm -hmm. I felt much more confident that way. And actually the, the 
the bit that really brought it together. So in, for a long time, it didn't have the letters to my great grandfather. Okay. That was something that came at the end when I thought there's something missing. So, um, you know, as a writer and any writers watching this, you know, sometimes you have this, this manuscript and you're loving it and, and, and you, you just feel like there's something missing. What is it? Mm -hmm. And then I sat down and I realized I need to reach out to my great grandfather, but I don't want to do it in a, I didn't want to do it in an objective historian way. I yes. wanted to do it as his great granddaughter. Um, and now he can't speak. So, and I also didn't want to write history in the sense of guessing what necessarily, you know, writing, right. you know, a little bit of dry history. So I thought, you know, this book is actually about me building connection with, with these ancestors and with him. And that's what this whole journey has meant so much to me. Or that's the reason it's meant so much to me because um, I've always had the stories. And now I've built on those stories and I have these, these, these questions I could come to him with mm -hmm. um, from, from where he's to and where, where I'm to. And, and you know, you come to um, a, a better understanding of yourself mm -hmm. and uh, your, place in, your place in the whole story that's, un, that's unraveling in the Métis Nation, Canada, all that. So. <laughs> Michelle, can you read from us an excerpt from your book and just tell us why you've shared to read this particular section? You know, when I'm asked to, to read a little bit, I tend to read um, the preface, the beginning, because it sets things up really nicely. It explains where I'm from, it explains who my great grandfather was, and what I'm, what I'm looking to do in, um, in this uh, book so and 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 i'm going to start with my very first letter to of course my great grandfather we called him uh, he was always known as pepe of course you know as a child i didn't know his name was bob or Robert or leon <laughs> yeah. it's always pepe my dear my dear pepe i trace you in the stories the women in our family tell and in the oral family tree shared at all the auntie's kitchen tables heavy with all the coffees and cookies and bars made of chocolate, icing, sugar, and butter. I find pieces, in you, uh, pieces of you in the photos and records and official family tree documents the uh, women kept in their closets to prove how, who they were in case anybody asked. You are there in the genealogical book, a researcher from La Societe Historique de Saint Boniface put together in order to show, show the breadth and depth of our ancestry in support of my membership with the Manitoba Métis Federation and citizenship with the Métis Nation. The family tree is not a light document. It has weight. In my hands, it's heavier to pick up than I expected. The family tree exists in two spiral bound volumes and these pages trace our family back to the time of the voyagers and to the first French who came to the land we now call Canada. These 200 pages include copies of script records I've never seen before. They hold stories that aren't written in the documentation of father, son, uncle, and mother, daughter, aunt. The stories are always trying to break away from the plastic coil binding. You're on the first page of the family tree book, right there. From my mother to her mother to you, my great-grandfather. Sometimes the stories I've heard make me forget that I've never met you. I've never called you Pepe while you were there, across the room, about to look up and see the child asking for your attention. With each letter, I travel deeper into an old fire started by our ancestors. With each word I place on paper, I am looking for you. I am looking to understand your place in the Métis Nation and my place as your relation. I write to understand the story of our belonging to each other. Writing is a way of calling out to you. We never belong to each other in the way grandparents sometimes belong to their grandchildren. You never fried pancakes for me the way you did for my mother, and you never played fiddle in any kitchen I danced in. You were gone before I was born. Yet, each time I find some new detail about your life, the thread that pulls between now and back then gets tangled up in the wings of an emotion I can't name and it takes days to unravel. 
maybe you could help. I will laugh and have fun at my expense. I'm not really expecting a voice from the spirit world, but you could answer in the bits and pieces of history that I uncover and weave together here. This, there is this too. If I learn to listen in the way that this story needs, you'll keep answering after this book is published. This story we are telling will never be finished and it will be told again and again with beginnings and endings that shift, that change shape. I'm going to pause here and ask how long the reading needs to be. <laughs> I can read a bit more or I can stop right there. Uh, that's perfect. That's oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. No, that's perfect. And it actually is the perfect segue into my, my next question because you've said that writing this novel changed your life. Um, how would you say it's changed your life, Michelle? Well, um, part of the process of, of writing this was bringing me not just back to my great grandfather, but to my mother. <laughs> and, you know, my, my grandmother has passed on, but, but as well to her stories. Uh, so, um, and during this time, I was grappling with um, uh, what, what you might be like personal issues from unresolved trauma. Uh, both my life and, uh, you know, just the continuation, you know, that, that snowballing downhill from, um, uh, you know, colonial impacts. Mm -hmm. And in writing this book, it was a huge healing process. Um, it's called Approaching Fire because one of the metaphors I take from the natural world, at the time I was writing this, there were huge, huge fires, those big fires in British Columbia. And of mm -hmm. course, every year since, those ones, um, there were, you know, states of emergencies of fire at different parts of the world. And in my personal life, yeah. there was a fire burning. Um, and I took great comfort in writing about the healing power of traditional burning fires and the idea that what was happening to me was something that needed to happen, that it was a healing process and that I would grow after it. And that if I let it happen, um, if I let it burn, um, and if I invited that healing process in as difficult as it was, um, something new and beautiful would grow at the other end. And, and it, it did happen through this book. One of the, one of the demands of writing um, about, of writing and doing research following Indigenous topics is the requirement that you are um, that you are responsible for your words, and that you are, and that you connect with your community to make sure that your words are, um, that, um, that your words are moving in the direction of heal, broader healing for the community. So I was very nervous about showing this book to my mom. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I didn't know how it would go over, and and I didn't I went during the writing I didn't think about it I wrote what I needed and uh but I thought I can't go forward without showing this to my mother there's so much it's, it's her story too um and I passed it on to her and it became a beautiful um connection between us mm -hmm. she and I um have had many conversations about it um and about those stories and she has become so, so proud of the stories and of my desire to tell these stories. Yeah. Um, and I think it's changed her as well. So there's been a sort of movement, a reconciliation in my relationship with my mother, which hasn't always been easy. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful uh, that way. Um, and I think walking through the fire and understanding that fire, um, lets you know that you can walk through anything and that you can walk through it again if and when it's needed and you can set the traditional fires that you need to have set and keep taking care of yourself as you take care of the land and your relations and my relations with, with my mother with my grandmother my ancestors and my daughters yeah. <laughs> all of that right so it's it's like I can stand up in all of this. And that happened through the process of writing this book and um, taking the steps that I need to do to do it properly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, how brave and, and, and beautiful of, of you to share that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> and your grandfather, I mean, obviously he was speaking to you throughout this process. What is the, um, your biggest lesson from your grandfather? Oh, he has a sense of humor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he really does. Now that, that comes out in many of the stories I've heard, but, but, but also in, in, in the music and my understanding of, of what it is to be a performer. There's that. There's also the understanding of where my own desire to create comes from. And it's what I'm doing is part of an intergenerational gift. Uh, when I have heard, we uncovered some of what we now know are some of the very first recordings of, of traditional Métis music ever made in my auntie's closet. <laughs> oh. Just stashed away like they didn't mean anything. And oh. um, when I listen, <laughs> some of this music recorded in the house, they begin. There's, there's the, it begins with the baby cooing. And I asked my mom about that. She said, that could be me. That could be my younger brother, Donnie, <laughs> that you're hearing at the beginning. Oh and then the music God. begins. Um, and um, I heard myself in that music. I am not a musician. I did learn to play some of the fiddle, but I don't speak to music. But what I felt when I went during the process of this research, what I felt about my great grandfather and my grandmother in listening to this music is um, I know these people. They are poets who brought their poetry to the fiddle and to the other instruments. They played other instruments as well in this whole band. And I am a musician who tells, who makes music with poetry and with yeah. words and creative nonfiction. And I felt, oh, that's what I'm doing. There's such a, there was a passion, this deep emotionality, this, that this, 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 this fire in it that I, um, it was a, a solace to recognize because I am as much as I can be a very, uh, you know, other people looking in can say she, I'm a very reserved person, but inside it is not reserved stuff going on. <laughs> and, I heard that in that music and I thought that's where it comes from <laughs> and I, I learned uh, that that's what my great-grandfather is as well so I, 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 I brought that to him and to my grandmother and could understand as well the difficulties of their life at the time um, and and uh, you know my, my initial question was why did you move from Manitoba where all this music was happening <laughs> and you know, he did it. In, 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 in talking to different people in the family, um, he spoke of not wanting his daughters to experience the racism he was experiencing in Manitoba at the time. Now, you know, one of my answers at the end of that, or one of the questions I ask is, do you think, you know, great grandfather, do you think, Bob Boulay, that you avoided that? Because in some ways, there isn't, an, uh, you can't quite avoid, well, the fires uh, of yeah. life. You, could, you might put it off, you might feel different, and in BC it had a different shape to their lives. Mm -hmm. But his intention in leaving his music behind, for the most part, and leaving his, uh, and bringing his daughters out of Manitoba was to give them, hopefully to give them, them a life where the intense racism because of a lot of the prejudice lingering uh, from the resistance, still lingering from that resistance, yeah, yeah. Um, um, was to give them, you know, to, to, that they wouldn't have to face that the way he had faced it growing yeah. up. Um, and, you know, no life is without, no life is without its challenges. So, you know, BC wasn't, wasn't um, uh, free of those challenges but that was that was his intention so i could see this beautiful caring for his daughters and also caring in his passing on the music and how important that that was to him what it, what an incredible man like what an incredible man i think so too yes yes <laughs> What, um, Michelle, what, for anyone who reads your book, what would you like them to walk away with? A sense of what it means across time 
to, to be Métis? Because there, I think right now there's a lot of confusion to be Prairie, Red River Métis. A lot of confusion about what, what it is to be Métis, to, to be an ancestor of, of these people and its long-term and its long-term impacts on the shape of our lives. Uh, but also what it means to be able to heal, to walk through a healing process mm -hmm. and to be able to um, stand through, you know, I, I call it a burning, but different people have different ideas of what their healing process is, but that you can w begin to walk through it. Now, there, there is also this idea um, that, you know, certain generations out are the ones who carry that intergenerational trauma load, especially among Indigenous groups. But I think that can apply in some ways to, to any group of people who have been through a collective trauma, such as Métis did, such as First Nation did, but that um, we do inherit um, some, uh, in different forms, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, stories and traumas. We also inherit their strength and resilience. Yes. And there comes a generation whose responsibility it is to burn those unresolved traumas and build something else from it. And that really is what I took from my book, <laughs> from writing it, and what I think is the beautiful, hopeful thing for others reading it as well. Absolutely. And what are you currently working on right now? Oh, I'm working on a novel. <laughs> oh, actually fabulous. Fabulous. I'm, I'm, uh, that, that's the main thing at the moment, but a novel uh, based on my grandmother's life. So at the end of Approaching Fire, I set it down at the feet of my grandmother. So I'm following my great grandfather there and I set it down at her feet. So I'm working on a nonfiction book in the longer term about my great grandmother that picks up from Approaching Fire and says, that was the story of the men. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. here, and this, here's the story of the women because it's it's different kind of research and it's different stories. Um, the research is different because you know it's even harder to trace them because they weren't known by their last names. They were known as Mrs. So and So or the you know, so it's harder to find their stories that way. Um, and some of their stories can be you know cloaked a little bit. But so first, while I'm doing that research, I'm working on a novel that picks up those stories, but in some sense it becomes easier to tell because it's told in fiction and mm -hmm. I don't have to adhere to as much careful accuracy yes. and um, I can play a little bit with with the meaning and outcome a little bit so I'm doing I'm, I'm, I'm with my grandmother now <laughs> oh how lovely you're you're being with your whole family I think that's incredible <laughs> <laughs> thank you and Michelle a great, great, great big thank you to, for being on All About Books today. I've really enjoyed learning more about you and your grandfather. And I'll put links down below in the description box so that um, people can go to Breakwater's website and also purchase a copy of Michelle's novel. And come back next week and I'll have another author and more behind the scenes stories. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me and thank you for such beautiful questions. Aw, oh, thank you.